This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard Fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all you future bold leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Ann Pratt. I'm formerly from South Africa, and I relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Leadership Fellowship in beautiful Boston in the United States of America. Our bold leader today joins us from Zimbabwe, a landlocked country in the southeastern part of Africa, loved and cherished for its dramatic landscape, its natural wonders, and its epic wildlife safari adventures. He's the group chief executive of Econet Wireless in Zimbabwe, a telecoms, internet, and satellite business, and built the business off a low base of 200,000 subscribers in 2002 to more than 20 million by 2020. In the group business, he's helped expand operations into Botswana and Nigeria. He has a doctorate in business leadership. He is a published author of A Dusty Road to Success, Principles of an Extraordinary Life, and he is a visiting professor in practice at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. We warmly welcome Dr. Douglas Imboweni and welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. So Dr. Douglas Imboweni, thank you so much for joining this conversation. It's a great privilege to have you on. You've had a remarkable journey, personally and professionally. Thank you for being part of this conversation today. Thank you very much, Anne. Really appreciate it. Is there an example you could share with us what has been some of the toughest moments in your business life and career? And thank you very much. I think my experience, even as chief executive officer, dates back to 2002. I was actually appointed the chief executive officer of Econet Wireless in Zimbabwe on the 1st of April, 2002. If you remember the history of Zimbabwe, back then, Zimbabwe had already entered into hyperinflation. This was the period when Zimbabwe was actually assisting the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. And that was a very expensive war because literally, if you fight any war flying over another country, it's a very expensive war. So the economy in Zimbabwe felt the pressure. And, 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 And clearly, we saw the devaluation of the dollar. So running a business in an environment where hyperinflation is taking a huge rise, is a big challenge. And I was the chief executive officer. And I learned how to survive in a period and a time when the change that was happening in terms of uh, price of commodities was just tremendous. And so running a business in such an environment where there is no stability in terms of exchange rate, is a huge challenge. And that is one of the biggest challenges that I faced. And that went all the way to 2008, 2009, when yeah. the economy dollar up. So it was indeed a tough, a tough challenge. In fact, I know that that was the time when uh, quite a number of my own colleagues uh, could not stand the environment in Zimbabwe and they actually left the country. You know, I mm. recall reading some statistics, Douglas, that in fact, you know, with Econet, wireless, which was listed on the Zimbabwean Stock Exchange, I think in 1998, amidst all this turmoil, can you take us back to what was a specific dark moment in the period that you've painted? The day was the 4th of November, 2004. Um, I was on a flight from South Africa and I was told to report to the police. I was actually jailed for 19 days. Uh, on uh, charges that were related to the business, but which were later proved to be false. 
in my entire life, I had never imagined being in prison cells. And I must say that is the one time I actually remember the 27, more than 27 years of Nelson Mandela being in prison. I was in prison for 19 days and I could imagine a man being imprisoned for 27 years. Yeah. And so I had bitterness when I got into the cells because I was saying, I'm an innocent man. But yeah. something fundamental that Nelson Mandela says about what challenges do can, or problems can do to a man, either it will break you or it will make you. And so yes. I remember those words very much and I chose to be made by the circumstances, the tough circumstances that I was experiencing. And so yeah. I said, just like Nelson Mandela said, you can allow circumstances to make you. I said, tell you what, let me learn from this tough circumstance. It's a dark moment, yes, but yes. I will not allow it to push me down. Was that in your prison cell, Douglas, that you, you had that? Yes, I think the first three days in my prison cell were very tough. I was thrown into a cell with criminals, real criminals, if I may put it that way. And for me as a businessman to be thrown into the same cell with such people, I felt very bitter. And I, yeah. I felt a lot of anger, but yeah. then I realized that that anger, if I kept it in me, it would destroy me. And I remember actually one of my colleagues who was also jailed at the same time with me, whispered to me, say, if you want to survive this patch, yeah. you need to have a positive attitude. And that's when I started reflecting on other people who had actually been, who had gone into uh, worse challenges than me. And who else but Nelson Mandela? <laughs> and so actually, that, I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, with all those years, uh, I mean, and he just let out the bitterness. I mean, he did not allow the bitterness to define him. And, and, and that for me was a fundamental lesson, let me tell you. It was a fundamental lesson, yes. So in those days in a prison cell, you've got your colleague whispering an, a thought, a very important thought in, into your ear about choosing an attitude and then reflecting yes. on many great leaders, including, um, and obviously pivotal was Nelson Mandela. What did yes. you do in those next days in prison that helped you then process that anger and pivot out? And even, you know, not only in your time in prison, but also when you yes. came out of prison. I reflect back and I actually can see that possibly there was a reason for me to be there to minister to the people who were in there. There were eight prisoners. And yeah. I started actually speaking to them, encouraging them. Um, I'm a Christian um, and I actually started, my wife actually brought me my small Bible and I found that I was actually now speaking positive words of encouragement to fellow prisoners. And so that transformation for me was so fundamental. And when I look back, I realized that, yes, you may be in a dark moment, but yeah. look out for what you can do for others. So I think one can choose an attitude, whether to, uh, to, to really let it pull you down or to say, yeah. tell you what, I will sail through the situation with a positive attitude. So that was yeah. one of the things that we did in that, uh, in that place, yes. So Douglas, after prison, did it change the way you, you know, the way you think, the way you act and the way you lead when you came out of prison? And if so, how? Most definitely. And um, first of all, it taught me to appreciate other human beings. Because um, when, I mean, when you go into our prison system here in Zimbabwe, and I suppose it's similar to anywhere else, they remove your artifacts, so what, what you, I mean, no suit, so you are in a khaki uniform, just like anyone yeah. else. So yeah. it's like an equalizer, that's number yes. one. So you begin to appreciate another human being because from being chief executive officer in ties and suits, now you are sitting next door to another fellow human being and there is no differentiator. And in a way, you look out for each other. There is a way, even though they are criminals, there was a way of actually identifying with one another because you are in a common boat. Um, I remember one of the challenges that we had in the prison cells, of course, is um, the challenge of lies. I mean, you get beaten by these lies and 
I remember actually being an advocate uh, to the prison authorities to say, no, 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 no. We need to fumigate these places uh, for, for our common good. So yeah. you, you begin to see the challenges that are within the prison cells. And in fact, that is something that I did even after leaving prison. It yeah. opened my eyes to the suffering of fellow human beings in such environments. And so I then deliberately began a program to assist those who are in prison cells, even though I was out, because my yeah. eyes had been opened to something that yes. I never knew. Yes. The other thing that I learned, which is a serious lesson, is the fact that you cannot hold on to a position forever. Um, we are generational people, we come and go. Of so course. it has lent, taught me a fundamental lesson where I begin to cherish the, the issue of mentorship. As a leader, I know that I'm generational, people come and go. And in yes. fact, when I was in prison for those 19 days, the, the business life was going on. So things didn't stop because I was in prison. And yeah. so I, I then began to understand that a good leader prepares for a time when he's not available. So yeah. all those were actually fundamental lessons that came to me. The other one, of course, was, um, you know, uh, initially for the first few days, I refused to eat the food in the prison because it, was, it wasn't good until yeah. the hunger visited me. And there is no differentiator. They would serve the same food and you, you would eat the same food. So essentially it taught me to value life and the basic things of life. And this is something that I've kept up to, to now. Yeah. yeah, and you know, um, Douglas, I, I kind of picked that up. I mean, you, you authored a wonderful book, I think titled A Dusty Road to Success, you know, Principles for an Extraordinary Life. And, and I was curious about, um, in that book, in choosing that title, what did Dusty mean to you? Was that related in any way to your experience in prison or are you referring to something different there? Right, no, Dusty Road refers to back to the village. And okay. so I was born in Joseph Village. It's a very remote village um, characterized by poverty generally uh, because it's actually in what we call region five of Zimbabwe, which is one of the driest parts of the country. Uh, we yeah. receive less than 450 milliliters of water every year. So it's, it's not a very um, lucrative in terms of agriculturally. And so that's where I grew up. And, and so we used to head cattle, uh, goats and so forth. And it, dust was part of it, part of the process because of the dryness. And yeah. so for me, I reflect back and I realize where I sit now in the corporate office, and I, I realized that the road has been quite dusty to get to where yeah. I am. And that yeah. is what uh, inspired that title, that a dusty road to success. And, and the village occupies a very pivotal um, role in, 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 in my life, quite honestly, because my early years were fashioned and nurtured by the village life, yes. Well, that leads, leads us to an interesting question, Douglas, because often from a leadership point of view, you know, understanding where we come from and those early childhood influences that shape us. In a nutshell, what do you think shaped you in that village? I think what shaped me and is the, the relationships. Um, each time I look back to the village, what resonates within me is the love and the warmth of the people around me. Um, it, took a, it took an entire village. Yes, I had my father, my mother, but I actually remember very well the relationship within the village was that even as I was heading the cattle, if I saw an elder walking by, it was part of me to greet them. It was as good as seeing my father or seeing my mother. Yes. And that taught me a value system. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's captured by the word Ubuntu, you know, which yes. of course... I am well if you are well. And, 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 and that is the philosophy that really embedded me as an individual to know that I'm, I cannot be someone without the supporting relationship that I have from other people. So that for me is so fundamental. And in fact, it has actually caused me to go back to the village 
and to invest in that village because I do realize I owe the village for what how they shaped me from my early stage. Is there a tough moment that you had um, in the village? And can you just share again if there's a specific event that amidst this love and warmth there, you know, there was a really tough time that required you to evoke a better part of yourself and was an important child lesson? I completed my primary education in 1977. And 1977 yeah. uh, was possibly the toughest period during the war because that was the transition from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. It, it was a tough yeah. period. Yeah. And I remember very well, um, my father was a school headmaster. And there were people who generally, I mean, sometimes you find this in society where you can get an individual who can actually be envious of another person. It also yeah. happens in the villages. And so my father was a school headmaster and I remember he had uh, a pocket radio, you know, those small FM radios that he mm -hmm. used to play music and he would walk to school and come back from school. And someone actually said, no, 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 he's a sellout because he's actually having a walkie-talkie, you know, walkie-talkie. And my father was actually then taken in for interrogation. And that was one of my toughest moments. So what happened was that during the war, as you know, you have two camps. So there were the uh, Zanla combatants and then there were the Rhodesian forces. Yeah. And so someone then said, my father was a sellout. So they basically so, um, reported him to, 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 the, to the Rhodesian soldiers that he is actually communicating via radio uh, using uh, all these devices. Yeah. So he was, he was actually picked up. And in fact, he was in trouble by both sides because I mean, in a war, you can actually be caught in between. So yeah. he was actually picked up by the Zandla people and they interrogated heavily. And then the next day, he was also then picked up by the Rhodesian forces and they said, you are feeding the other camp. So he was caught in between. Now, uh -huh. there is nothing as tough as witnessing as a young person to yeah. witness such a trauma on your parent. I thank God that nothing disastrous came out of it. But I remember very well, it was a very traumatic time for me. And you, you, you lose, you can easily lose trust in people. And so you become cautious. You become very guarded in your Is that how you became? Other. Is that how you became? I became actually very cautious and very guarded. Yeah. And in, in fact, it was very difficult to trust any other person um, after that kind of uh, situation. Yeah. It's something that I had to walk out of. But I think after that, my life was now more of being very guarded when I, treat, when I, when I, when I relate to people. I don't think it's always something that is good for you to have, but yeah. that's something that I became. I really became guarded. Even when I went to university, I was very guarded in terms of how to relate to other people. And so, so I must say that that also had another shaping of some kind when I was young in the village because of the traumatic experience that I saw uh, my dad going through as a result of other people saying untruths about it. So yes, yeah. I can say. How did you navigate through that, Douglas? What, what are the kind of steps? When did you realize that being guarded and perhaps mistrusting was not serving you? And how did you navigate out of that? I mean, trust is such an important aspect in how we connect with people, not only from a leadership point of view, but in our personal lives. I must say that the way I walked out of that situation was learning to communicate and learning to be accountable. So I'll tell you what I do now with my, my colleagues in the, in the business sector. I've, I've got executives that report to, you, to me and I, I don't want a situation where I can be suspicious of my colleagues. In leadership, it, it will be very dangerous for me to always be suspicious. Now, what is the one way that you can eliminate these things? Communication, communication, communication. Yeah. I reflect back in the village, if people had only asked 
to say, yeah. can you explain to us what's going on? What is this device? What is this? So in other words, what I learned now is that if there is any misunderstanding on anything, I should not conclude without seeking the explanation of another person. And the accountability piece, I mean, you speak about yes. accountability me. I'm yeah. not beyond <laughs> accountability means I'm not beyond approach. I don't want to be a CEO where people are talking behind, behind me when they see something wrong. In fact, I will tell you one practice that I have in my office. I do sign a lot of, I do sign a lot of authorizations. And I've actually asked one of the accounting officer in the finance department to literally audit everything that I do. So on a weekly basis, I tell him that I will give him a call, even if it's for 10 minutes. And I'll say, you have been watching all the documents that I sign, all the authorizations that I give. Do you have an issue? And I told him that he should be very frank with me and be very upfront. That's accountability. And so what he does is he normally calls me and say, can you explain why you signed this document? What was it for? And I have yes. to explain. Now, yeah. that's his vulnerability, being vulnerable even to junior individuals so that you can be transparent in what, I, what you do. I believe that is a quality that we should take across the board, particularly even in our nations as African nations, that issue of accountability and transparency yeah. is absolutely key. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and to know that even with junior people, they can contribute a great deal of value to what you do. And again, I can tell you that even uh, when I read about Nelson Mandela and even his relationship with other people, you know, when you go past people who serve you, it's easy to ignore them. But to wait and shake their hand to acknowledge them, that's a serious depth of respecting other people, irrespective mm -hmm. of social, social position. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I admire as well. And that's what I, I also practice. Mm -hmm. yes. What does that do for you, Douglas, when you do that? It creates so much positive energy. Because when I see another individual being uplifted by what I do, it also uplifts me. And what I, I notice that positive energy breeds or rather gives rise to more positive energy. When I see other people being encouraged, it also encourages me. So I saw a wonderful interview that you did um, on Father's Day, um, talking about your three beautiful children, Sandra, David and Matthew. And right. uh, there was a beautiful picture of you and your, your lovely wife, um, Sarah Dawi, and uh, your three, right. three beautiful kids. And really talking with great passion about your, your privilege and role as a parent and passing on these principles or values. I've read just very briefly about your seven principles. And if I recall correctly, your seven principles are um, um, identity, um, purpose, yes. empowerment, balance, success, action, legacy. Um, and, and I wonder to what extent in terms of those principles, uh, you, you know, to what extent are those principles part of your business life integrated in your business life? And to what right. extent does Econet Wireless practice those principles and values? I summarize those principles by using the acronym of which you have just articulated, IPEPSAO. And because I noticed that in my position as the chief executive officer, I always must be clear in terms of my identity. And this is something that I've also communicated with my colleagues in the business, that identity is like an anchor. It's an anchor point so that even in times of trouble, it's, it reminds me of a ship in the yeah. midst of the, of the waves of the sea, your identity is like your anchor that, that, that keeps you from straying away. And that has actually been very helpful for me, even in um, hyperinflation days within our nation of Zimbabwe. And then of course, purpose, what am I here for? And, and, and I find that even as I articulated these issues to my colleagues in the business, they really find it very encouraging to realize that if they know who they are and what they are there for, it drives them very positively even in the business. 
And then, yeah. of course, the issue of empowerment and where you are empowered to do what you have to do. And I love to empower people in my own business where if you are given a task, you also give them the empowerment to do the task. And then, of course, the issue of balance came in because I'm a family man, but I'm also a social leader, just as I'm a corporate leader. I must learn to balance these things so that I don't excel in one area at the expense of the other area, which is where the whole issue of balance came in. Yeah. And then I also had to go on to success, where I expressed it as a mathematical equation, where I said mm -hmm. success is a, in brackets, your plan plus the resources multiplied by action. Because if your action is zero, mathematically, if you multiply anything by zero, it, it is zero. zero. So it doesn't matter yeah. what plan you have, if there is no action, success is zero. Yeah. And, and then of course, the issue of your, 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 your specific actions that you have to carry out and ultimately legacy. I mean, I look at Nelson Mandela and the legacy that he left, you can't replace legacy. And the legacy is something that I believe you take away. Your house, you will leave. You, 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 all these other things, they are left. But I believe that legacy is part of, part of the eternal value that you always carry away. And uh, I mean, when you, when you look at some of the uh, characters we have in the Bible with Solomon and David, I mean, you, when you go to where they used to stay, the houses they built are no more. But the legacy, what they did um, is recorded and it's recorded forever. So for yeah. me, this is the, these are things that I teach also in my business to the young people. And, and, and it has resonated so well. And it, it kind of um, drives away from chasing materialism and individualism and really creating an aspect where what we create as individual, as individuals is a, a lasting impact way after our own generation is done. Yeah. You know, Douglas, you've touched on such an important point. You know, some of the wonderful uh, leaders I've been talking to um, talk about this issue of this um, almost um, greed, avarice, conspicuous consumption, this, this obsession with possessions. And, um, right. you know, I noticed that, you know, when you speak about balance being one of your principles, and having this yes. balance between your social leadership and your business leadership, I wondered yes. as um, a captain, a powerful captain of industry, to what extent right. do you think capitalism needs to rethink its model in integrating social aspects into the business world um, and, and embrace these social issues, not simply as charities or corporate social investment, but bringing them into the core strategy in a sustainable way so that we redefine capitalism, that it's more inclusive and it's not simply about shareholders, but rather about multiple stakeholders. Right now, a lot of, um, there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the world systems. I mean, if yeah. you look at uh, what COVID has taught us, you know, COVID has, has been, in some way been an equalizer Something that starts in China has an impact in Zimbabwe, has an impact in South Africa, in the United States, in Europe. And I mean, what it means basically is that you can't afford to have a them and us mentality, which yeah. in some way capitalism has got this aspect where it says, tell you what, I can accumulate things for myself, even at the expense of other people. But when a tragedy strikes like a pandemic, that's when you realize, oh, oh it's not a solution uh, which is sustainable. So in a way, even as a corporate business, I'm very much aware for Econet being in Zimbabwe that we cannot actually have a mentality where we build our own profile or objectives that are far removed from the existence of other people in, in our society. From a corporate point of view, what I realize is that what I do as an organization, I cannot define goals that will just propel my organization forward, leaving the rest of the people, like for example, the customer base, society. And I have actually moved away from this uh, word, which we call corporate social responsibility. No, yeah. 
it's actually part of the whole fabric of our existence as a business. So I believe that capitalism has actually created a mindset in some cases where people want to maximize profits even at the existence of the environment, at the existence of other groups of people. I believe that holistic prosperity is one which carries everybody along with it, uh, which carries society, which also carries the environment, where you create deserts out of your environment, siltation of the rivers, for example, and yeah. when there is poverty in society, it also breeds behavior, which is actually very damaging to the business community. And so I believe that it's no longer corporate social responsibility. It is the very life of the organization. And so it has to be part of the strategic intent of a business to do good, not only to the environment, to the people, but anything that really is a 360 degree um, or environment of the business, it has to be promoted. And how has Econet done that, Douglas? Yes, um, thank you very much for that question. We, you know, you may be interested to know that Econet, before we were granted a license to operate, which we did in 1998, already in 1996, we had already formed a, a foundation, and it was called Capenam, uh, Capenam Trust by then. Capenam yeah. Trust was formed before Econet to take care of the needs, particularly of the orphans at that particular stage, the orphans and the widows, even before we opened our doors for commercial launch. Mm -hmm. And I remember my chairman saying that it is our responsibility, irrespective of the performance of the business. Now, that, that was a, a mind shift because normally what people do is they allocate a portion of their profit. Yeah. But my chairman and founder of our organization basically said, no, it is our responsibility even before we make the profit that you talk about. For me, that was a fundamental shift from corporate social responsibility. Because I know a lot of people who pull back from that responsibility because they say, no, 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 uh, the costs are getting too high. We have yeah. seen that in Ecolet, year after year, even during the hyperinflationary period, when a lot of people cut down their budgets on corporate social responsibility, we didn't look at it as a corporate social responsibility. We looked at it as our responsibility in society, end of story part of our business. It was part of our very existence. And that was something completely different from what I'd experienced before. And that is the yes. whole mentality we have kept even up to now. So how do you budget for it differently? Can you just practically take us through, you know, the okay. foundations there are set up? How do you budget for it in such a way that it's not a kind of cost that could be cut to, you know, depending on the profit levels? How do you build that into the business model? Thank you. We took and adopted when the organization was launched, Econet was launched in 1998, was that 2% of our revenue is yeah. set aside for intervention. We call them interventions in society, in the environment, 2%. Now, I'm saying 2% of revenue. Now, this is irrespective of what else you will do because it's actually the top line. I yes. know a lot of organizations normally look at the bottom line we took a position to look at the top line. Yeah. In, in addition to that, our license as an organization was issued on the 31st of December, 1997. That day is considered a Thanksgiving day within Econet. So all revenues, gross revenues, which are obtained on that 31st of December of every year are actually channeled towards social intervention. And, 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 and there is no negotiation, there is no debate about it. It's something that yeah. our board is very clear about and yeah. it is a Thanksgiving item. And, and so these are some of the interventions that I have seen that are pretty extraordinary because they don't look at, okay, so what are our cost lines? Can we afford it this year? No, this yeah. is a standing position and we believe that it, is, it has been part of sustaining the organization to where we are now and even assuring us of our future as we go into the future yes yeah that's that's an interesting 
shift in mindset, as you say, and a very different way of bringing it into the business model in a very committed way. Um, I, I was wondering your thoughts, Douglas. I know you also lecture part-time as a professor of practice at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And uh, of course, yes. you know, you've blended your amazing business life, your academic life and, and your social life. What keeps you awake at night? You know, if you think about the very, we're at a pivotal moment in the world, you've spoken about the pandemic. What are the, the kind of three big leadership challenges or contextual environmental factors that keep you awake or concerned about where Africa and the world is at today? I think the first one that I look at, and, and, and this one um, is, is very deep within me, is the one I would want to call it mentorship. Now, why mentorship? Because our world today is a crisis. It is a crisis of, it is a leadership crisis. And my real desire and yearning is to see if we can get men and women who have learned the art of true leadership to mentor the next generation of leaders. You see, I have come to a position where I'm no longer that person who basically complains about, oh, we have got this guy who is a bad leader and so forth. It doesn't help me at all. My mind now is, okay, that is a given. We have got corrupt leaders. We have got corrupt institutions. But it's all about people. So how do we ensure that the next generation of people is robust and solid? And that is all around mentorship. Mm -hmm. Item number two has been impact. So I'm saying to myself, yes, I want to see a group of youngsters who are mentored into their next phase of leadership. But I also realize that my own life as an individual has a limit. I can't live forever. What I do on Saturdays, I have got a passion of actually training young people. In fact, this last Saturday, I had a group of 20 young leaders uh, yeah. with me. And, and I was just basically, literally just pouring myself to them in terms of how I'm so hopeful that they will be the true next leaders, authentic leaders for the next generation. Yeah. So that for me is absolutely key. And then I would say the last thing that I, I, I that, that is also causing me quite some restlessness is documentation. To put in writing the things that I have in my mind. Because I do realize that some way, somehow, um, there must be some institutional memory that remains. And I mean, keep putting it in a book. I mean, I, I look at, uh, at this book that I wrote, which is the Dust Road to Success. And I'm yes. saying it's now documented. So even when I'm long gone, at least there is something that people can pick up and say, oh, okay, let's look at it. So documenting, which is something that in Africa, a lot of value has gone with the people that have gone. Yeah, I, because I, I want part to, of storytelling and how, you know, traditionally you. it's been about sitting around <laughs> the Indaba and oh, fire. Around the fire. Talking, yes. Yeah. And, and that social aspect is, is disintegrating. It used to be effective, but now yeah. I believe that putting it in writing is one sustainable way of ensuring that it lasts. So I would yeah. say those are the three things that I would cite at this stage in terms of something that really occupies my mind um, when I think about things that keep me awake. <laughs> those are the three but things. What's What's interesting about that, Douglas, is that all of these go back to where you began, which is really about the leadership crisis in the world. And so right. if I listen to you correctly, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though the biggest issue that concerns you is about the quality of leadership we have in the world. Correct. That's correct. The, uh, you are absolutely right. Um, we have a world that has become so selfish, so self-centered, so materialistic. A leadership that basically says, well, I care for my own at the expense of others. Um, you know, I, I think, for example, if you look at the whole COVID pandemic, it actually exposed a lot of uh, issues worldwide, where you, you, certain sections of 
the planet could be saying, no, 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 let's, let's close them off. I remember I was actually in San Francisco, I must say this, I was in San Francisco around um, before Omicron hit. And I was on a flight which was canceled while I was in San Francisco. So I said, okay, I need to get back home. And yeah. literally I was left on my own with my wife and we, we were literally stuck because flights to Zimbabwe, South Africa, Zambia were banned. And then I actually approached several offices for solutions and it was like, okay, no, 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 that's your baby. I mean, quite honestly, you take care of yourself, including the airline that had taken my money. They literally just dumped me. And, and, and that left a sour thought in my mind to say, oh, okay. So really people can actually adopt an attitude where they say, it's your problem, you sort it out. Yeah. Yeah. That, that exposed a lot of, um, uh, I would say, individualisms that, yeah. that we should not see in today's leadership. But unfortunately it is there in today's leadership, yeah. And you know, just as an aside, Douglas, I mean, this is obviously a very big topic and question, but you know, around the world and even on the African continent, you know, there has been a question around the level of wealth and the, and the disparity between the haves and the have nots. So in your mind, what has been effective in shifting that mindset? People who are often part of the struggle, people who often were underprivileged and marginalized who've now gained access to markets. And how do we tackle this issue? How do we remind that generation that were underprivileged, became incredibly privileged and seemed to have forgotten a lot of those values and principles? How do we reset? It's a big challenge, I must say. And I'll share with you what I've done. Um, personally, in fact, it's a project that I'm working on right now. And I've gone back to the village. And I know that I'm privileged because I'm CEO of an organization. So I've built myself a house in town. And yeah. literally, I have no reason or need to go back to the village. So I think. But what has drawn me is the fact that I am where I am today because of the very village that I can shun and I can reject as not part of me. Had the village not been there for me, I would not be here. So it has activated a conscience in me to say, no, when I'm lifted up to where I am, I have a responsibility to lift my fellow villagers. So I actually, if you look at what I, in, in my book, uh, Dusty Road, I call myself a citizen of Joseph Village. So yeah. I go back to the village and I walk around meeting other villagers and I drive into the village in an expensive car and I pack it somewhere and literally walk from household to household and really saying, you, were responsible for taking me to where I am. Mm -hmm. What can I do for us to lift the life in our village? And I must say to you, and right now as I speak, we yeah. are completing a village center where there is a village boardroom and we are actually putting a communication center for villagers to come together now and again to research on, for example, we are an agricultural village to some extent. Yeah. So what are the best practices in, in agriculture? Yeah. I've also taken it as a responsibility to get once in a while an agronomist who goes to the village and talks to the villagers how to grow vegetables in the best way, how to rear goats or sheep or whatever you in the best possible way. In other words, imparting knowledge so that we can actually lift the village to another level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the guys have really appreciated that, 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 um, that, that relationship. And I, could, I can see, so we actually formed a, a trust which we call the Joseph Valley Trust, JVT. And yeah. the board members of that trust are villagers. So it's a, it, we have a board of 10 members. I am yeah. also a board member. And when yeah. we sit in that board, we share yeah. ideas 
we share what can we do we are now tackling issues of erosion in our village we are tackling issues of building a, a basic school for our village so and and some of the brilliant ideas have come from people who are not educated at all but they've got tremendous ideas of how to uplift the the village now i believe this is something that i would like to to challenge my fellow colleagues particularly in Harare, where i am i'm saying yeah. to my fellow CEO friends go back to your village where you came from and do something to lift the village that where you left it would be a pity for you to go and vanish out of this planet without an impact in the village that has been my view and i think the privileged people need to know where they've come from so that they can actually do something about where they've come from as a as a way of lifting humanity and if we all did that if we yeah. all did that the world yeah. will be at a different definitely and you know, Douglas, I'm curious, I mean, apart from the remarkable acknowledgement and affirmation of your village, and as we say in Africa, it takes a village to raise a child. That's right, that's but, right. You know, but emotionally and spiritually, what has going back to the village and being part of a very tangible social impact initiative to uplift the village, what has that done for you personally, emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually? How has that changed your life, if at all? Absolutely tremendous. And the advantage that, that, that I have, because Saruza and myself, we have three children. Yeah. And these children, one of them is now, I mean, two, the two of them are in, are in the United States, and one is actually in, in, in London right now as we speak. So it's the two of us now left. And what it has done and is, it has given us a deep sense of purpose, a deep sense of purpose. Because you see, when you build a house, a big house for that matter, and the kids are all gone, you begin to realize that you don't need the house because yeah. you can only sleep in one room. Yeah. And all the other rooms are now empty and, and they demand maintenance and so forth. And then you begin to realize that real value is not in material things. Real value is not in having fat bank accounts because even for food, you only eat one plate of food because you have got one stomach, which is small for that matter. So you begin to realize that your needs, there is a limit to which you can actually use your money for. And, and, and if, if, we, if we allow greed to take the better of us, we will keep on accumulating and accumulating and get out of this planet and leave them anyway. So what it has given me and my wife is a deep sense of purpose where we can go back to the village and realize, okay, where there was no infrastructure, we've managed to mobilize the villagers to work together and we've improved the state of our village for the next yeah. generation. And that gives me tremendous, tremendous sense of satisfaction. Yeah. I, I think I have not experienced any sense of satisfaction that is greater than seeing the upliftment of fellow villagers or fellow human beings. For me, that has been absolutely tremendous. Yes. Douglas, you know, you've spoken quite a bit and, and quite early on about uh, the role that Nelson Mandela played in a, in a very d dark time in your own life. Was that your most significant Mandela moment? Or were, was there another moment where Mandela really struck a chord for you? Is there a different moment? <laughs> I've got some iconic people in my life that um, have really shaped the way I am. Um, my chairman and, and, and founder of my group, uh, Mr. Strive Masiwa, has been a brother and a mentor and somebody that I, I look up to because, he, because of his value system. He really has shaped me. And what I noticed is that his kind of leadership really uh, is aligned to the Mandela, Nelson Mandela type of leadership, where it's not about pomp and fun, I mean, the, 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 the glitz and the, 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 the glitter around it, but it's about service. It's yeah. about servant, a servant heart. 
the ability to sit with you, to talk with you as an individual and to hear you out and to value you as a brother, as a sister, as a fellow human being. That's what I have seen. Um, so when I look at also Nelson Mandela's journey from Kunu village uh, to yeah. state house via prison, for me, yeah. it resonates. I mean, when I look at my own village and now being in the city and so, I realize, okay, so you can have that journey that is long winded, uh, yeah. a, a long road to freedom, uh, yeah. so to speak, just the road to success. Uh, so so it, it really resonated. So I would, I would not say that it's almost a reflection of the entire journey I'm with you. to where I am. Yeah. I can see the moment, I can see the, the, the value. And at the end of the day, it's about saving and not being saved. And that's what I see with Nelson Mandela. And of course, even when I saw the handover of power, the ability to be able to step aside and hand over, that's unique. I mean, in Africa, it's difficult. People want to die in positions. And, yeah. and, 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 and all those are aspects that are, are deep, in terms of learning, mentorship, which I've talked about before. So I wouldn't say it's one moment. I, I believe that Nelson Mandela's entire life has spoken into me. Um, yes. His insights, the, the ideals that he stood for, and very, very boldly standing for those ideals. I believe in life, I should also have ideals that I should not compromise on. Integrity is one of them. And that. Yeah. Nothing whatsoever should ever uh, pull down the integrity pillar of my life. I should be able to say, this is an ideal that I stand for and nothing can actually interfere with it. So those are some of the fundamental lessons that have really resonated with me, yes. Do you think Mandela's leadership is relevant for our next generation and why? <laughs> Why it is because it's rare leadership, very rare. Um, and it's a leadership style that uh, the world today needs. It's a leadership that is built on selflessness, being selfless. Yeah. A leadership that is built on humility, a leadership that is authenticated by the welfare of others. In other words, I'm not riding on, other, I'm not sitting on other people's heads. We are joining hands and we are building our future. See, this planet, planet Earth, needs a team of leaders who will join hands with fellow human beings to solve the glaring problems of our society. If we do that, I really believe that we truly are living the, even the ideals that Nelson Mandela lived for. Look at South Africa, for example. Yeah. It was easy for him after prison to come out with a bitter heart and basically cause disintegration of that, that, that country by saying, this is time for retaliation, but he did it. Instead, he actually embraced every individual, whether black, white, Indian, Chinese, irrespective of where you came from. That's what we need in this world. The polarization we are seeing in our world today is because there are leaders who only stand for certain sections of society. And that is very dangerous. So to answer your question, yes, we need a Nelson Mandela type of leadership going into the future. There's no doubt. Douglas, any final thoughts? I mean, that's a very powerful note and that's a, a very heartwarming reminder. Any final thoughts around leadership and leading boldly into the future generally or any final thoughts around what do you think Mandela would say to our leaders in the world today? And I, would, I have been observing the trend in the world today. We have talked yeah. about VUCA, this aspect of volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, and all these things that we are seeing, the complexity that we are seeing around us. Yeah. And it's not getting better. It's not getting better. It's getting worse and worse. We have seen the climatic changes, technology changes. We have seen even the issue of the pandemics. And now they basically say, 
The pandemic we saw with Corona is probably lighter than what we are going to see in the coming years. Now, given this complexity, it needs leaders who can brace up to the task of dealing with those kind of challenges. Yeah. It will not be dealt with by the kind of leadership we have today. And I would say that if Nelson Mandela was standing with us today, he would be crying and urging for a, a leadership that is conscious to the gravity of the complexity that is facing us. Therefore, setting aside our, our personal agendas and running with a more inclusive agenda for the sake of saving the globe, of saving humanity. That is what I would say. What a powerful note to end on, Douglas. Dr. Douglas Mbaweni, such a privilege to talk to you. I hope you come back again. And thank you for your words of wisdom. Thank you for your acts of service. Thank you very much, Anne, for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Talking to Dr. Douglas Mbaweni brings home the power of making willful, conscious choices in troubled times. In prison for a crime he didn't commit. Despite the anger, the bitterness, the despair. When he asked himself the question, will I let this injustice define me, break me, or make me, he consciously chose the last option. It was in that conscious choice that the healing and the transformation began. He found meaning in the adversity. He learned valuable lessons about himself and what matters. And in his prayerful actions and joyful singing, he not only healed himself and encouraged his prison mates in his soul, but they healed, encouraged, and uplifted other prisoners and prison guards too. The choices we make are often defined by our childhood village where we grow up the values and principles of our elders, the people that have gone before. They shape our identity, they help define our moral compass and courage, and it is the circle of life. So what is the circle? It is the end of a beginning. It is the beginning of an end. We repeat the patterns of those that have gone before. And in the circle of life, we learn how we're all interconnected. Like baby Simba in Disney's Lion King, his father, Mafasa, the king of the lions, taught Simba how to overcome adversity, evil, threats, and greed. He taught Simba that in order to protect not only the lion pride and their land, he needed to protect the entire kingdom, all creatures in the kingdom, so that the balance of nature could take its course and nature and his pride and his kingdom not only survived, but thrived. You too, like Simba the Lion, like Douglas, and like Nelson Mandela, can make conscious choices and go back to your village with your head held high. And in protecting the village, your people, your tribe, you know that it is all interconnected. Like Simba, like Douglas, like Nelson Mandela, we need to protect and respect all creatures in the kingdom in order for the kingdom to thrive. It is the circle of life. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. That's A-N-N-E-P-R-A-T-T.com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon, share with your friends, Sign up on ann-pratt.com and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.